So this morning, um, we are completing. This is the end. This is the end, the end of... No. Um, nobody knows that song. <laughs> no, it's a real song from, tell me somebody, the 60s, 70s? It's the Doors from... 60s. This is the end. I'm quoting the Doors to welcome you. Again, my name is John Arelli. Um, would you raise your hand, please, if you feel like you've got good faith? Good faith. I'm going to tell you, if you have good faith, it has radically transformed your life. If you have good faith, it's radically transformed your life. Uh, this morning, we're completing this sermon series on what we call good faith. And uh, the title of this this morning is On the Road to Your Impossibly Great Life. I was talking with someone this morning, and they felt like they were talking to somebody who was going through some trouble, struggles, and, and the question kind of came up. I can't remember how it was, but the, the, the question was asked, you know, what's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is good faith in Jesus. That's the meaning of life. But it feels like to go there, to say that, feels like... I've got all the answers, like I'm a snob or something like that. But we truly do have the meaning of life, and it's good faith. But it's an adventure. Good life is an adventure, and we're on the road to impossibly great life. And this is what it can often look like. Go ahead and put that slide up. There's uh, these movies that we've seen, and... Um, you see Star Wars there, uh, and also uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and also Lord of the Rings. And someone who's nerdier than I am could tell me exactly what episode these are of these series. I can't tell you. Uh, but there's something that's actually very similar about these stories. They were all written in the same time. They were all written in a group of these guys who wanted to write the story, the myth, of Great Britain. They felt like Great Britain didn't have a great myth. And as they began to write the great myth of Great Britain, they realized every single culture of all the world has this great myth. Uh, we don't understand it as a myth. We understand it as something that's revealed from God. But they all wrote towards it. And Williams wrote uh, what had become Star Wars. Somebody took it on as Star Wars later. And C.S. Lewis wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and that whole series. And Tolkien wrote, um, someone nerdier than I am at this moment, please. Lord, Lord of the Rings. You don't have to be nerd to, be, to know the Lord of the Rings. I just had a brain goof right now. I had a senior moment at the age of, in my 30s. Here we go, senior moment. It's fascinating what we can take from this because... Each one of these stories involves the same program outline. There is someone, and they are living in their very simple world. And it's not very adventurous. And to be at the top of that world might not take too much. For Frodo to become king of the Shire might not be the biggest adventure in the world. For Luke, he could be the best farmer on the planet that he was from. I can't remember. But something takes them out of that world and invites them into a spiritual adventure that involves fighting spiritual darkness of some sort. Something bigger than themselves. Something certainly bigger than what they were involved in in their normal lives. This is the impossibly great life. Everyone talks about this it's what we call the hero's journey. Every culture has it. They have this one, the hero's journey, and they also have one called the rise and the fall of the harvest. Every culture in all the world has carried these two myths along forever. We all share them. The rise and the fall of the harvest, I've got my own theories about. But certainly the hero's journey, I think, invites us as if there was something that God put in the nature of creation to invite us into something different, to alert us that there's something going on in the world that we don't see. And it's this impossibly great life. 
Certainly we could be champions in our old, you know, our own ordinary worlds, but there's just something, there's something that's drawing us, each one of us, all over the world, to this impossibly great life. In the world that we know, we would call this the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, Jesus would say, is at hand, right at hand. Some scriptures would say, within us. I like the translation that says, at hand. The kingdom of God, it's like, if you, who's seen the Lord of the Rings? When Frodo puts the ring on, he sees all kind of different stuff, right? It's as if the kingdom of God is at hand, and we don't see it until we're invited into this impossibly great life. But there are some keys to living an impossibly great life like these characters that we see here. Bring up Philippians 4.9 if we would, guys. You actually have to do this stuff that we've been talking about in the series Good Faith. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you've heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and all you've received. Some things that we talked about in this whole series, prayer is really critical to good faith and the impossibly great life. Prayer is really important and time in the Bible. And we started this series, and I just encourage five minutes. Just take five minutes to pray every day. Five minutes. And then take five minutes to read your Bible. And it's through those just simple practices that we enter in to seeing the kingdom of God around us. Community. You see, in the hero's journey, Frodo didn't go alone. And whenever he did, he got into trouble, didn't he? There was a community of faith. There was a community in whatever faith you would call in whatever character's lives, there was a community that was going on that was encouraging them in this impossibly great life. The hero always has a fellowship. This could be very hard, but whether it's a small group that we talked about or these Sunday mornings, make it a pre-made decision. I know that can be hard, but getting up in the morning going, I don't know if I want to go or not. I don't want to go if I get up in the morning and go, I don't know if I want to go or not. Make it a pre-made decision. Make it a pre-made decision to be in the fellowship of the Mission Vineyard. You thought I was going to say the ring. No, you didn't. It's okay. Another part of this impossibly great life in stepping into this hero's journey is partnering with God. And to get started, I've given you a little key, and it's in your blue pamphlet thing this morning. You had a welcome card and you also had a little white card that says praying for your six. What on earth are you talking about, John? And what do I have six of? I will tell you what you definitely have six of in your life. And if you don't, you should pray for them. Six people in your life that aren't experiencing God right now. Six people in your life that are not experiencing God right now. Praying for your six is one way that we can enter into the kingdom of God and the work of the kingdom. And then I put a little line underneath that first line where you would put their name, and that next line says how. How is really important because it's a way that we go, God, how do you want to, me to join with you in what you're doing for this person? Everyone. God is on a rescue mission for everyone. And when we begin to pray for these six people, that are just a stone's throw away from experiencing God. We get to join in with what God's doing in their life. So as you put down these names and you begin to pray for them, I would encourage over the next six weeks, Christmas is a really fun time to pray for people, for them to experience good faith, to experience God, to experience Jesus, to experience the Holy Spirit. We're going to continue on through Christmas into a season called Epiphany. And Epiphany is this revealing time. It's this time when we celebrate that there was an appearing of God to people. So I would just encourage you, as a church, can we do this? Can we pray for six people in our lives to experience God who are not experiencing God right now? Can we ask Jesus how we should pray for those people? And not just, uh, God, that they'd experience you. 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 God, that they'd... All right, go! But to ask God, 
how should I be praying for this person? And let God, just listen, just listen for one minute, for one full minute about that person. And just write down, just trust that God's speaking in that moment. You don't know. So dream for your big six, but then enter into this time, I would encourage, of serving like crazy. And as a church, we're not doing this very well yet. We're going to get there. We have lots of opportunities. And I look forward to January being a time of explosion where we just get into groups and teams and we go out and men and women and all of us together and children and we're just doing crazy amounts of stuff. Serving, out there, not being about us. But it's when we are out there talking to a person that we would have never, talking to the one, identifying the person with dignity. I was walking around at the car show yesterday and on the way, I don't know how many homeless people we saw. Plenty. And I, as I woke up this morning, I went, oh, Lord Jesus, that they didn't die of exposure. Each one has a name. Each one on the street has a name. Each one in need of help has a name. And I would just encourage you to think of the one. Don't think of the world, but think of the one and pray for the one and act for the one. And it could be your neighbor. It could be a co-worker. But partnering with God in these ways. Another way that we get to enjoy partnering with God in the kingdom, adventuring on this hero's journey, it's very, very simple, but it's just faith. Having faith. Having good faith. And what do I mean by that? Faith that God is good to me. This is very, very hard to think of. When you wake up in the morning and you feel like you've been hit in the head by somebody or you're a victim of something, believing that God is good to me is the beginning of good faith and this road on the hero's journey. It's huge. Because if we think anything else, we could be thinking that God's out to get us. There's two paradigms that people typically have in this moment. It's viewing God as either doctor or boss. And viewing God as, as boss can be really fun because you get to look at your job description and go and do all that stuff for your boss and hopefully get a raise. But I, w I don't think that's good faith. I think good faith is more seeing God as a doctor who says, this is really good for you. And you want to follow what the doctor's prescribing. This is good for you. I'm for your benefit. Doctor's not going to give you a raise. Not going to give you more medicine if you act good. It's not the way it works in, in good doctor practice. I'd encourage believing and having faith that God is good. There are pretty typical ways that people might get derailed in this moment of being on the adventure. And I know the Lord of the Rings better than the other two. And so you remember when Frodo is kind of going off and getting, becoming in struggles and just he's struggling with this role that he has of carrying the ring and being on this adventure, wanting to go back to the Shire. And, you know, how did he get involved in all this mess and just, I don't want to do this anymore. In our adventure towards good faith, there's a couple ways that we get derailed. One of those ways is choosing persistent complaint over persistent praise. Do you know anybody in your life, point to yourself first, please, who is a persistent complainer? Persistent complainer. I mean... When anything, oh, I know, that's just me. You remember Saturday night's uh, skit? There was uh, a girl named Debbie Downer. And it was like, hey, how are you doing, Debbie? Well, you know, I wish it could be better. Persistent complaint versus com consistent praise. It's a sure key to continuing in struggle in being able to join in this hero's journey if you're consistently complaining but choose consistent praise. And if you need to, grab some awesome gospel music and play that. I've got my Donnie McClurkin on a bad day when I've got some bad faith in that way. You've got to, and just put it in your car or in the shower. I know there's some people here that sing in the shower. We, they want to sing in worship teams. We can't accommodate them. Get some Donnie McClurkin. Get somebody who's going to announce, I came for deliverance. Deliverance I'll receive. They'll, they'll declare in faith. They will praise even though they don't feel like it. Choosing consistent complaint over consistent praise will always get you down. Choose consistent praise. 
Another way that it's just classic, classic ways that people get derailed on the road to their impossibly great life is choosing disappointing sex over scorching, lasting sex. I'm a big believer of scorching, lasting sex and not short-lived, disappointing sex. I'm a big believer in that. But there are some ways that scorching, lasting sex happens. If I remembered better this morning, I would have had a piece of cardboard. And that piece of cardboard, I would show you, it would look like this, but thicker, right? How's cardboard made up? You got a sheet of paper and then another sort of corrugated middle, right? And you got another piece of paper on the other side. If you just imagine for me, because I didn't prepare very well this morning, you can imagine with me, use your imagination, of taking one piece of that cardboard and trying to rip them apart. And I want you to imagine for just a moment what each side looks like. This is what we're left with when we choose to enjoy sex with people who we're not joined with in covenant of marriage. And there may be some people here that have wounds of this, that have experienced this, that don't know what to do with this, they feel shame from this, they've never looked at it before. I want to tell you, Jesus' grace is full right here. But it will continually derail us from the impossibly great life when we choose sex that's not with someone who we're married to. Because every time we separate from that person, there are pieces left. And those pieces of you get left with that person. And the person, pieces of that person that get left with you for life. Unless Jesus heals you completely, which he does. He's miraculous. We believe that God heals. One word I want to introduce you to is something called a soul tie. A soul tie is something that we do, we, be, we participate in, when we connect with people in such intimacy that aren't connect with Jesus. It can happen across a, all kinds of different relationships. But we choose to become intimate in ways that Jesus is not wanting you to. And when we engage in that intimacy, we create soul ties. Now, in marriage, we create soul ties. And those can be great. They, they can be really destructive, too. When they're not in marriage, or they're with people that aren't following Jesus, you begin to have a tie, but in that tie, you have people that may be engaging in stuff that, that don't follow Jesus. And you're still kind of connected to those people in a spiritual way. I encourage you to choose persistent praise over persistent complaint and choose scorching, lasting sex over disappointing sex that creates soul ties with people who aren't following Jesus. I would encourage you to choose hard scrabble reality over abundant, terrifying faith. This is, this is what I'm encouraging here is an open-handedness. If you know some people in your life, they have a very closed fist about life and about finances and about generosity in general. I would encourage you to have open-handedness. When we close our hands like this, it's because we don't want to lose what's in our hands. But when someone comes along to bless us, we also don't get to receive. So I would encourage you to live open-handedly. But that means that sometimes stuff leaves. That could be your heart. That could be finances. That could be whatever you think is so valuable that you'd want to keep it so safe. Jesus is encouraging a beautiful open-handedness where we get to give away all that Jesus is doing in us, all that Jesus is giving us. I would discourage choosing open, uh, I'm getting these mixed up. Choose abundant, terrifying faith over choosing hard scrabble reality where you fear losing what's in your hand. Be generous. I would encourage openness rather than hiddenness. And some people get lost here. I don't want to be open about everything. Don't be open about everything. Don't. But choose openness 
over hiddenness, and I'll tell you why. For some reason, in this hero's journey, when we're alone, we're our worst, and we are an easy target when it comes to spiritual darkness. Easy target. Openness defeats one of the biggest demons, which is shame. When we're open with anything that we feel bad about, anything that we have hidden in our hearts, when we're open about them in safe and beautiful ways, not in codependent, share to everyone, looking for something else. When we're open with the stuff in our hearts that we're shameful about, it opens it up to Jesus to heal, and it allows us to continue on a beautiful road of good and beautiful faith. Choose openness rather than hiddenness and defeat this demon of shame. Would you bring up Mark 4? This is what I believe Jesus thinks is an impossibly great life. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lakeshore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. No, sitting on a boat is, is not possibly right life. Let's keep going. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and some birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among the thorns that grew up, and it choked out the tender plants so that they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as it had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone, the 12 disciples and with others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, the hero's journey. But I use parables for everything I say to outsiders, so the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they'll learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they'll not understand. Otherwise, they'll turn to me and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? This is an encouraging word from Jesus. I'm going to teach you about this. And here he goes. The farmer plants seed by taking the word to others. The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. This is good faith. Sharing good faith. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, only to have Satan come at once and take it away. Maybe there's soul ties involved. Maybe there's relationships that just don't, that aren't really good soil for the seed. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the closed hand, the lure of wealth and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on the good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or a hundred times as much as it had been planted. Hear this. And the seed that fell on good soil, good faith, represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even a hundred times as much as it had been planted. Normal, shire life. You plant a seed and you don't know what's going to happen. It might grow into something. I don't know. But God's adventurous life invites us into a good faith that produces multiplication of good faith. This is the incredibly, impossibly great life that Jesus invites us into. But it's scary because it means that we have to have open hands. It means that we don't get to play around with people and and create soul ties that would connect with us until Jesus heals them.
we're invited into the kingdom of God. Jesus is at work. Jesus is on a mission for the one. Jesus has named people, has put an identity in them that he wants rescued and restored. Jesus wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit, give you gifts, empower you in ways that you'd never feel like you had the energy to do. He wants to wake you up and give you praise in your heart where you might have complaint. And he wants the world, beginning with you, to be transformed by this. I have friends that want their lives to be awesome, and they're really worried about their lives being awesome because they don't know what major to choose or what job to take or what to do in a relationship or not. You have these six people in front of you that you're going to write down, you're going to pray for, please do this. And you're going to ask Jesus, how? How should I pray for these people? The beginning of that for me is a beginning of a conversation with Jesus where instead of just saying, God, I need, we say, God, how do you want me involved? How do you want me to join with you in what you're doing in the world? By doing that, we begin to practice a listening, an intimacy, where we get to hear the words of the Father, and then we begin to hear the words of the Father for us. God will surprise you. He's done this for me even this week, 2 a.m. in the morning. Typically, I've got a list of people that I pray for. Siri reminds me at different times of the day, pray for this person, pray for this person. And I've got to tell you, most of the time it's, God, that they would experience you, and I'm back to my hammer or drill or something like that. But at 2 a.m., he woke me up, and he began to tell me about my life. Because I've been trying to listen for other people, trying to practice this life of intimacy, he woke me up. And it wasn't that I had to try or struggle. I didn't, you know, feel guilty about not hearing from God. But he made time. Because I've stepped into this incredibly, impossibly great life of great faith where I try to listen, where I try to obey, I try to pray, I try to read the Bible. Not because I I work for a boss, but because the doctor said, the good doctor said, do this. It's going to give you great life. And he spoke to me at 2 a.m. about my future. And it was really beautiful. God's a good God and loves you and wants good for your life and invites you in by his love, which you can never be separate from, into an adventure. It's an adventure. I tell you, it's an adventure. And something you can't even dream of. You can't picture in your head. But the beginning of that is saying yes to Jesus. I sat with a friend, a new friend, as she began to say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me from walking away from you. Forgive me from... Forgive me for not reading my Bible anymore. God used to use her in ways that would open up the scriptures to people. They would come to her and say things. It's like, what does this mean? And God would pour through his Holy Spirit through her. And she wasn't the most intelligent person in the world. She wasn't a genius. But God would give her revelation about the scriptures. She said, God, forgive me for not doing this. Forgive me for going to another religion and, and seeing hope there. Forgive me for going to this other man instead of you. And she began a journey. I don't know what it's going to look like. There's no guarantees when you say this prayer with someone. But she began this journey. Every Sunday we do this. We we do this through something called the Lord's Table or the Eucharist or Communion, where we come forward and we take a piece of bread and we dip it in juice and we take it in. And all that we're doing is in a very beautiful and mysterious way that Jesus instructed us to do, we're taking Jesus in. And we're saying yes to Jesus. If you've never done that before, I encourage you to do that today. Everyone's welcome to the table of Jesus. This is the table of Jesus where you don't have to bring a dish. 
He's prepared himself. He says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. This is my table where I invite you. And at the table, he cleans feet. He cleaned Peter's feet at that table. Washed off his feet. Feet that had been worn. This is Jesus. He invites us to his table. Would you say yes to him today? By coming forward, taking the spreads, taking Jesus in. Say yes and begin this hero's journey. Would you do that? Right now, Michael and Jan are going to come up, and Michael's going to read from 1 Corinthians the instructions, or Jan's going to read one, one way or the other. One of them will read it. And they're going to read these instructions that Paul wrote to the church in, in Corinth. I'd invite you to, to follow those instructions to leave everything else behind. Leave any anger against people. Leave any feeling like you, uh, someone owes you something. And come to the table of Jesus and just be fed. And then we're going to continue in worship together. Would you come? There's a word that was given for someone this morning. Um, yeah, this would have some relevance to you if this is for you, if God's speaking this for you. A uh, wash or a washing or uh, a washing from a burn. Or, um, there may even be someone from here. There's been a guitar. There's something happening with the guitar in your life, and the guitar's name is a wash burn. That w- we don't know what God's doing there, but would you just? I would just encourage you for, to go for prayer if that's you this morning. If God's speaking to you through that, that you would you'd receive that and receive prayer for that. For anybody who is feeling broken from any soul ties that they've made, I would just want to declare on you right now in the name of Jesus healing and that you would go and receive prayer for that. That in the name of Jesus, there's healing for everything. There's nothing. There's nothing that would separate you from the love of God and there's nothing that Jesus cannot heal. His mercy triumphs over judgment. Would you stand and receive a blessing? I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to go out into this hero's journey, into this impossibly great life filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to do his will. In Jesus' name, amen. On your seats this morning, there were some blue uh, pamphlets that say something about a star. One star, one hope. This is a cheat sheet for you. Over the next season of Advent, next Sunday begins this beautiful season of Advent where we begin to grow in anticipation of Jesus coming to earth. And so this is for you as a devotional. Every sermon that we'll have will follow this devotional, so it's a cheat sheet in that way, so you can be prepared. But take one, and then there's more on the table. If there's someone that's not here with you right now, would you just take one and give it to them? that we can begin together in anticipation of the Christ child. Cool? Go in peace. Finish whatever carbs are there. Have some coffee. Have a great week.